thank you everyone for coming to another HPL seminar. It's my pleasure today to introduce a new faculty member at the University of Calgary, Corinne Roach. She is an assistant professor in biomedical engineering and a uh, assistant professor in the Department of Radiology at the Cummings School of Medicine. Prior to coming to the University of Calgary, uh, Corinne finished a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. She then went on to do a PhD at the University of Utah in Bioengineering. Following that, and just before arriving in Calgary, she completed a postdoc in Radiology at uh, UCSF in San Francisco. So uh, she's interested in osteoarthritis development, multimodal imaging, and uh, computer simulations of, of uh, joint degeneration. So yeah, I'll turn it over to her now. What's yeah, that? Part, part lab, yeah. So. Thank you for the introduction. That was great. Is this a clicker? Let's see. Maybe not. Okay. Um, I don't usually mic, so this is going to be a new thing for all of us. Um, but yes, I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, a lot of my work is in um, musculoskeletal imaging as well as biomechanics. Um, so today I'm hoping to go through some advanced statistical techniques that I've been using for my biomechanics and imaging data um, in the hopes that maybe you have an application that this might also work with. Um, hopefully these are new techniques that you haven't seen before. Um, so I'm gonna go through them in a little bit more detail than I probably normally would, um, but please feel free to like hop in and ask questions at any point. Like I'm hoping this is also useful for everyone here. But yes, we're gonna overall talk about OA. Okay, so just a little background on osteoarthritis. Um, arthritis is the number one cause of disability in North America. So huge socioeconomic burden on our citizens. Um, and the thing I wanna highlight is that a lot, there are no ends, there are only end stage options available, no interventional treatments. So, you know, if you have a hip or knee replacement, that's fine. You can have your hip or knee replacement replaced, but in smaller joints, such as in the hand or the wrist or the foot and ankle, it's really hard to do a revision surgery on that replacement because there's just not enough bone left. Um, thank you. So what we really need is um, better methods to detect osteoarthritis or OA earlier. Um, so our current uh, reference standard is using radiographic measures. So kelgren lawrence grading or KL grading. Um, so this is a scale of zero to four. Um, and it could be argued that this is semi-quantitative, often subjective. I'm not a radiologist, but I have a lot of trouble telling the differences between grade one and grade two in the knee. Um, the knee is often the easiest easiest joint to look at KL grading. Um, so imagine it in a more complex joint or a smaller joint, it gets even more difficult. Um, so again, very hard to, dis, um, to assess early stages of the disease, which makes it hard for us to assess progression, right? And then um, we don't have any soft tissue information. So um, emerging techniques have come out in terms of quantitative magnetic resonance imaging or QMRI. Um, and so just quick overview of, col of collagen, of cartilage. Um, it's comprised of collagen or primarily comprised of collagen, proteoglycan and water content. So using MR imaging, we can uh, run a T1 weighted sequence and this gives us an indicator of how much proteoglycan is, is in the cartilage. So specifically, if we have higher T1 row, we have decreased proteoglycan content. So on these images of the knee, when we see red, we're looking at higher values of T1 row or T2, meaning more degeneration of the cartilage. So then of course, T2 is an indicator of water content and collagen organization. So again, increased T2, more degeneration, increased collagen disorganization, as well as increased water content. Um, so the general hypothesis around osteoarthritis is that we have abnormal or an excessive mechanical stress or loading scenario. This causes damage to joint tissue. So this could be an ACL rupture and we have cartilage, um, car severe cartilage damage. So the body attempts to repair this joint. This can be successful or can lead to additional mechanical stress or uh, abnormal stress conditions. What I'm interested in looking at is how we can intervene and kind of prevent this cycle by looking at abnormal loading. So abnormal uh, loads can be caused by numerous factors. 
Um, and here are just a few that I've looked at in my research. Um, and many studies have investigated one or two of these factors at a time, but it's very unlikely, right, that osteoarthritis is occurring just in isolation. One of these factors um, is much more likely that it arises due to a, a combination of these factors. Um, so what we really need is a multimodal analysis that kind of combines all of these different factors together in a way that we can help determine what our causes of OA really are. Um, and so we can do that by evaluating different states of the disease using cartilage, health and structure, which I kind of talked about with T1 row and T2. We can look at morphology and pain just to look at a few things, but also, you know, patient reported outcomes, that type of thing. Um, and so this is the gap I'm interested in filling um, by taking more of a multimodal, multimodal analysis approach to um, looking at this problem. And so I've kind of grouped things by joint loading and mechanics, as well as quantitative imaging and patient history and demographics. So today we're gonna to focus on joint loading and biomechanics as well as imaging. Um, so my work has focused on ankle bone motion using biplane fluoroscopy, as well as looking at lower limb biomechanics using skin marker motion um, analysis. So that was more of um, some mediation analyses as well as compensatory motion of one limb versus another. And then physical activity using inertial measurement units. Um, on the imaging side, focused on quantitative MRI, as well as positron emission tomography MR. And this allows us to look at bone remodeling, getting at that question of subchondral bone. Is subchondral bone what is degrading first, or is it the cartilage, kind of like a chicken and the egg kind of question? Um, and so my hope is that um, now with this amazing uh, professorship here at UCalgary, we can bring all these things together, start look, to look at a more multimodal analysis um, and the means to look for OA biomarkers, early detection tools, and interventional therapies. So today, just in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about some of the work I've been doing uh, looking at lower limb biomechanics as well as quantitative MRI um, and some of the statistical techniques I've been using in that regard. Um, so this data was collected and analyzed during my postdoc at UCSF for this, for all the work I'll kind of talk about, it's one uh, project. So we collected 97 participants with early to moderate hip OA, so it's KL zero to three. Um, we collected data at four time points, baseline one year, two years, so annual follow-ups. Um, we just got a renewal so that we can continue that for another four years, which is great. So we collected skin marker emotion analysis, quantitative MR, as well as demographics, patient reported outcomes. So we looked at hip disability and osteoarthritis outcome scores or the WHO's questionnaire, as well as some functional tests. So 40 minute walks, sit to stand, stair climb, and side plank tests. Um, so to start with, I'm gonna go through um, a study I did on looking at multivariate analysis of our gait biomechanics. So when we talk about biomechanical studies, especially when we're looking at the lower limb, um, we collect um, a series of data. So, you know, we have our hip and our knee and our ankle sagittal plane angles over um, a gait cycle. And often when we do run an analysis or traditional techniques running an analysis, will isolate, you know, your maximum flexion or maybe the internal rotation at heel strike, and then we discard the remaining information. But what if the remaining information is the pathway somebody gets to that maximum flexion? Could that have important information that perhaps we're overlooking? Um, the other thing is we often can't combine all of our different metrics, our moments and our angles from different joints together into one analysis. Um, so I started to look at ways that we could use all of this time series data that we could combine our analyses together and started using multivariate functional principle component analysis. And that's a mouthful, so I'm going to say MFPCA. Um, so just as a show of hands, how many people are familiar with PCA? Okay, so do I need to go through my slide on PCA? I can just do it quickly, maybe. Okay, so if you're not familiar with principle component analysis, no worries. Basically, we can talk about a gait cycle, right? Um, and we can say that our number of our number of components, or our measurements, is the dimensionality of our space. So when we're looking at a gait cycle, and we normalize it typically um, to, so from zero to 100, so we have 100 points. And if we look at three joints, and we look at three planes of motion, we're looking at potentially 900 different dimensions for our space. So this makes it very hard to interpret our data. So what PCA allows us to do is to reduce this dimensionality. So PCA has become really popular and other feature is a feature extraction technique for machine learning and AI. Um, 
and helps us improve our interpretability a little bit. But essentially, if you have your data here, PCA will identify your primary eigenvector, so the primary direction of your variation, which is here along that red axis, um, and then finds the secondary or tertiary, et cetera, uh, of the most variation in your data. And then you can replot your data along those new axes. So the important thing to remember here is that your first PC mode is always going to have the most variation, or it's going to account for the most variation in your population. And the second mode will be the next most variation and so on and so forth. Um, does that, any questions about this? Great, you guys are such a lively audience today. Okay, so for this study, um, we wanted to characterize the variance across combined hip knee and ankle angles. And we wanted to look at that in healthy and early OA participants. We also wanted to investigate these relationships between, uh, or investigate relationships between these waveform features and our hip cartilage health. Um, so I took joint angles and I fit these angles to functions. So that's the functional part of MFPCA and then ran MFPCA by a joint, or sorry, by plane. So what this meant is that I had my first MFPC analysis was sagittal hip, sagittal knee, and sagittal ankle angles. The second PC analysis was all in the coronal plane for those three joints. And the third was all in the transverse plane. You could do this differently. Um, in the next study I'll present, I did um, all, I did sagittal hip, coronal hip, transverse hip. Um, so you could look at different things. I also investigated looking at all nine of these together and it just got to a point where you couldn't interpret it. It was just too much. Um, so it does need to, you do need to maintain interpretability, right? For this to be a useful tool. So I stuck with three. Um, but essentially this gave us five PC modes. Um, we also acquired bilateral hip MR images. We use these to calculate T1 row and T2 maps. Um, and then we would average over the cartilage. So again, we're averaging over 3,600 points. I'm gonna come back to this, um, or 3,600 voxels um, to get a mean cartilage T1 row and T2. So mean cartilage, uh, mean femoral cartilage T1 row and T2 and mean acetabular cartilage T1 row and T2. Um, then used a stepwise linear regression to um, determine the PCs that were predictive of our mean T1 row and T2 values. Um, so I'm not going to go through, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the results, um, but overall acetabular cartilage was related to BMI, um, or sorry, mean T1 row and T2 in the acetabular cartilage were related to BMI, and then our sagittal plane MFPC mode one was related to T1 row in the acetabular cartilage and for femoral cartilage, T1 row and T2 were more related to transverse plane PC modes. Um, so we're just gonna focus on sagittal plane. That's a little bit easier to understand as that's our main um, plane of walking or we're looking at walking, it's our main plane of movement. Um, so BMI, sagittal, MFPC one were related to acetabular T1 row. So what does that look like? So Let's go through and kind of look at this. We have our black line, that's our mean. So that is independent of your PC analysis. That's just the mean across all your patients. And because we combined this, we can look at this PC mode in terms of what's happening at each joint in the sagittal plane. So essentially what I did was I took the variation of that first mode and multiplied it by three standard deviations. So you get plus and minus three, um, three standard deviations of that mode of variation. So individuals who had higher PC modes had less flexion and extension at the knee, hip, and ankle. So represented by the red. Um, and since it was related to our acetabular T1 row, we can say that those individuals who had less hip and knee flexion, greater hip and knee extension, were more likely to have greater degeneration in their cartilage. Because again, right, T1 row, higher T1 row values were more degenerated. And what we can do is we can look at individual pay, um, subjects and how they fall within this PC range. So here we have in orange subject 74, they have very high PC scores. So you can see that they have greater um, hip extension and then they're kind of more along the lines of um, average on in terms of knee and hip flexion and extension. Um, and we can look at their T1 row values and we can see that they have slightly elevated values um, in the acetabular cartilage there. And we can also look at a subject that has very low um, PC1 scores. So that would be subject 90 in the light blue. And we can see that they have increased hip 
knee and ankle flexion, um, closer to that minus three standard deviations. And then when we look at their T1 row values in the acetabular cartilage, we can also see that, especially in comparison to subject 74, right, they have much lower values here around 20. Um, so what we found in this study is um, the way the kind of the transverse plane PC modes and the sagittal plane PC modes worked out. Um, increased internal rotation was more related to femoral cartilage degeneration, while decreased flexion was more related to acetabular cartilage degeneration. So along with BMI, um, we theorize that maybe femoral cartilage is just a bit more sensitive to changes in transverse plane joint motion, perhaps than um, the acetabular cartilage, which might be more sensitive to alterations in the sagittal plane. Um, but really the great thing about this study was establishing a framework for um, kind of a future extraction technique to use and help reduce our dimensionality, um, give a little bit more power to our biomechanical studies and make full use of our data, which I did in my next study. So um, the next two studies I present on were part of my fellowship, um, looking at predicting osteoarthritis, but also looking at characterizing um, osteoarthritis progression. Um, so the, the aim of this study was kind of um, the next step from the study I just kind of presented. Um, and that was to develop machine learning models that employ gait biomechanics to predict mild to moderate hip OA. So specifically, I wanted a model that hip OA, um, to predict hip OA uh, that had an F1 score or recall greater than 0.85. So I wanted to minimize, I wanted to make sure I was, um, I was getting all, any potential person with OA I was characterizing or I, that person was predicted as having OA. So I wanted to minimize false negatives, I believe. Um, and then I wanted the results to be interpretable. So I used um, supervised machine learning practices and wanted to be able to get back to those biomechanical characteristics so that we could use them for future interventional studies. And then I wanted the models to be as generalizable as possible. At UCSF, we could um, collect ground reaction forces. So we had kinetic data. We could look at stairs data and walking, but not every lab has that ability, right? So we wanted to keep the data as simple as possible. If we could get a prediction model that was using just walking data, any lab anywhere should be able to use that kinematic data, for example. Um, so I started with walking stairs up and stairs down data and calculated joint kinematics and kinetics, then ran MFPCA as I kind of went through with, um, on the last study. And we also had demographics and ground truth, which was OA presence um, and absence. So it was a binary classification using our KL grading. Um, and yes, I do admit that it's not the best um, ground truth, but it is the reference standard currently. Um, split the data into training and test sets, trained and evaluated support vector machine or SVM, random forest, and neural network with one layer, just to maintain interpretability. Um, and then compared the test recall and test F1 scores. Um, so I typically hate putting up um, tables, but essentially what you wanna see here, F1 scores and recall for all of those models, I did not hit my 0.85. So I was like, oh, I'll add in the two other activities that we collected, squat and drop jump, and I still didn't hit the 0.85. Um, so, yeah, this was a bit of a fail. Um, so I went back to the drawing board and talked to some of my colleagues and um, came up with a new plan. Um, and this is still much a work in progress, but this is currently what we're um, going with. So still have our MFPCA scores for all our subjects, demographics and ground truth, still split the data same way. But this time we isolated five features. Um, and we did have quite an imbalance in terms of subjects versus features, over 100 features, but only about 70 subjects, right? So isolating five features kind of kept that in a bit more balance. And then evaluate, trained and evaluated a decision tree and then repeated that for all possible combinations. So it took a while to run on the cluster. Let's just put it that way. Um, so then I compared the test recall and F1 scores for all the different decision tree combinations and identified um, the model that performed the best and what features it used to predict OA. So the best model did or has so far hit um, a 0.85 for F1 score or above on F1 score recall accuracy and ROC AUC, um, which is great. Uh, there's still some more work to do here, but that's very exciting because it is walking, which is pretty generalizable. Um, and we 
know what features the model looked at. So it used HIP model, um, sorry, HIP model, HIP moment PC5, knee moment PC3, and ankle moments PC1 through 3. So the interesting, I think there's two interesting things here. The model really emphasizes, because I gave it kinematics and kinetics, it's really emphasizing the loading aspect. There are no kinematics um, or no kinematic PC modes that were featured here. Um, the other interesting thing is we're predicting hip OA, but it identified three ankle moments. Um, so still some work to be done in terms of kind of um, sussing out why that is. What we can do is similar to the last, um, study I presented is we can look at what that PC mode looks like. So for example, ankle moment PC1, we can see our average again in the black. And we can see that this PC mode is really driven by a change in this coronal plane at the ankle. So our inversion, eversion moment, um, as well as a little bit of a vertical shift here in the transverse plane. Um, and this is, as I said, still a work in progress. So kind of the next step is to determine which of these participants, is it the participants who have these higher scores, these higher PC one scores that have osteoarthritis or, or have osteoarthritis or if, is it the lower? So which aspect um, of this gate of these gate characteristics are actually being predictive of OA? Um, and then the final study I want to chat with you about is using QMRI to actually characterize our progression of osteoarthritis. Um, so UCSF has done a number and other labs um, have done a number of studies looking at how um, OA relates to uh, T1 row and T2. And there have been, I would say, moderate mixed results finding, you know, if they split the hip up into different regions, that there's an association between that region and a cartilage defect. Um, there's some modest correlations between morphologic changes as well as T1 row, but there hasn't been, and I think this is evident in the fact that we haven't fully moved to MR as our detection technique, there hasn't been this like smoking gun where everyone's like, ah, yes, T1 row is the way to go. Um, and so what we think is happening is, you know, if you have, oops, let's stay there. Um, if we have a lesion here, for example, I'm not saying that is a lesion, um, but if you have an increase in signal in one little area, you're averaging over 3,600 voxels, right? So that little area of increased signal is getting completely washed out when you average it across everything else. So instead of looking at the average across the entire hip, or maybe the average across a single region of interest that's just arbitrarily determined, maybe we need to do more of a voxel by voxel statistical analysis of looking at our T1 row and T2 times. Um, so the objective of this study is to look at patterns in our hip biochemistry trajectories over a two year period and then characterize um, early stage hip OA progression. Um, so we had a pretty even split in terms of men and women. Um, BMI was pretty, um, pretty even. Uh, between the two. Relatively, we tried to recruit an even number of KL scores, um, which we did okay with. Um, so how, we, how I analyzed this data, we collected bilateral hip MR images at a baseline acquisition, as well as at a two-year follow-up. Um, we then used these images to calculate T1 row and T2 cartilage maps, which we then registered to a reference subject so that everybody's in the same space. Um, and then we subtracted each subject's baseline data from their two-year data to, to create difference maps. So over time, generally your T1 row and T2 values should increase in cartilage over um, as you get older or as, um, uh, as, as you age. Um, we took these difference maps and calculated Z-scores. Uh, the mean and standard deviation maps that we used to calculate the z-scores, however, we pulled that data from a set of healthy subjects that had known clinical or radiographic or patient-reported um, symptoms of osteoarthritis. So we kind of term those as our healthy standard aging. So when we look at our z-score maps, each individual sub subject has this z-score difference map that is in relationship to these healthy participants or that healthy standard aging. So we can look at how our population changes in relation to that standard aging. So we ran PCA on these z-score maps, um, use those first five modes to then perform a cluster analysis. So in total, because we had T1 row and T2, we had 10 modes of variation. 
um, and then compared the clusters to start to dig into um, how do these clusters differ? How do these trajectories differ? And are we isolating different types of progression over the short term? Um, so I ran this in R. Um, cluster analysis can be a bit, at least in my experience, black boxy. Um, so I struggled a lot initially to find different ways that we could interpret this data. So look, that's great. This uh, algorithm gave me two clusters, but what does it mean? Um, so this is how I, I, there's a couple ways I'll go through that I kind of visualize and did a sanity check essentially. So here we can look at the probability that each participant or subject falls into each cluster. So um, I, we, I, I use the Bayesian information criterion to, uh, for this analysis, but it identified these subjects in cluster one. And it's great because all of these subjects have greater than 80% likelihood that they should be in this cluster. In contrast, beneath 20% likelihood that they belong in cluster two. And then in a similar fashion for cluster two, we can see these individuals less than 20-ish percent probability that they belong in cluster one, but above 80% probability that they belong in cluster two. And the important thing here is there are no subjects in this like intermediate range between 25 to 75%. The model was confident that they were either in cluster one or in cluster two. Obviously, this is an ideal situation. This could get a little bit harder to interpret if you have more clusters, three or six. Um, but I do think this is helpful in terms of just making sure that you don't have anyone kind of hanging out in this mid range of limbo. The other thing I looked at is the average values. So for cluster one and cluster two, what were the average values for my different PC scores? So for cluster one, we can see that our average values were above or above average for T2 PC1 and T1 row PC1. And then kind of in contrast for cluster two, we can see that they had um, the subjects in cluster two had below average T1 row or T2 PC1 scores. And then um, both cluster one and cluster two for the remaining PC scores, they're kind of right around zero for these average values. So kind of floating around average, nothing really kind of outside the norm. Um, and then of course, the nice thing we can do is we can go back to our PC modes and actually look at what this means. So we start with our mean z-score difference map. Um, and so as we kind of expect, most of our subjects on average either had the same amount of change over two years as our healthy controls, or they progress a little bit more. So they had you know, more yellow coloring. So then we can take, again, plus or minus three um, standard deviations of our PC1 variation. And we can look at that. So cluster one had above average PC1 scores. So we can look at that plus three standard deviations of PC1. And we can see that we have accelerated changes, greater changes um, in the femoral cartilage for both T1 row and T2 for those individuals. And then kind of on the flip side, we can see that cluster two had below average T1 row and T2 increases over that two year period. I wouldn't say that these subjects had a decrease in T1 and T row. I mean, you have to go into a little bit of a deeper dive to look at that on a more individual basis, but their increases were not as great. Um, certainly as cluster one and perhaps about the same or less than um, our standard healthy aging. So then I took a look at how do these two clusters differ besides our PC, our PC scores. So looking at some of our demographics um, data, um, found that we did have a significant difference in BMI between cluster one and cluster two, as well as our male to female ratio. Um, but the interesting thing was that the presence or absence of OA, KL score, and age were not influential factors between the clusters, which I found really interesting because the clusters were basically split up by whether or not you had um, accelerated changes in T1 row and T2, and that should be directly associated with age and OA. Uh, age, I'm still kind of mulling about. Uh, OA, this could just get back to the fact that KL grading is somewhat subjective. Um, so when we kind of, so cluster one, we kind of uh, termed as our progressors. They had greater BMI and right higher BMIs typically tied to osteoarthritis. Um, they were more likely to be male and they had greater T1 row and T2 PC1 scores. So accelerated changes in T1 row and T2 in the femoral cartilage. And then T2, oh sorry, cluster two, we kind of deemed our uh, stable or standard aging. They had lower BMI, 
um, they were more likely to be female, had smaller T1 row and T2 PC1 scores. Um, so that work uh, is, still needs to be buttoned up a bit, but um, there's also a couple of research extensions that I'm kind of excited about. So um, first and foremost is, can we evaluate these models on additional or external data sets, especially the prediction models to make sure that this isn't just like, oh yeah, it works for our data, it doesn't work for anyone else's data. Um, so how generalizable is our model? Um, and can we maybe evaluate these models against other ground truths? So um, I'm kind of in the process of taking a look at that. Maybe we compare to Shamri scores or who's or functional outcomes. Um, and then, you know, we were predicting, we were using biomechanics to predict um, people's current OA status. Could we predict future OA status or functional decline? Um, and could we take this a step further, maybe look at some deep learning models that might be a little bit more powerful. Um, and then, you know, we just might need more advanced ways to look um, to maintain interpretability. Um, and the other thing I'm kind of interested in looking at is MSPCA, I didn't go into this much, but um, it is multi-dimensional. So you could look at 1D and 2D data such as this. So you could pair your hip sagittal plane um, angles along with, here I have SUV um, from a PET-MR scan, but you could pair it with T1 row or T2 or any type of imaging data. Um, and it would give you a PC mode that encompasses both. I'm not sure if this is useful or not, but it's something I was just interested in playing around with. Um, and then can we use this as a feature? So basically combining those last two studies, can I use MFPCA as a predict as a feature selection tool to then predict our hip cartilage trajectories in that last study? And references. And of course, this isn't done in a vacuum. Um, had a lot of help um, and support from mentors and colleagues to funding. And yes, I uh, forgot to mention this earlier, but I am always looking for good students or postdocs. If anyone is interested, please let me know. And that's all I have. I don't know, what's your GPA? <laughs> uh, so uh, when you say acetabular versus femoral cartilage, I just want to know that I, that what I, I, that I, I know what you're talking about. So do you mean that the articular cartilage on the, on the acetabulum versus the articular cartilage on the femur, or do you mean? Exactly that, that's yes. What you mean? Mm -hmm. So with that MR, you can actually dissociate these two femoral, these two cartilage surfaces. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So you can see a thin line between the two. Um, we actually had an automated segmentation process that would split up the two through a registration technique. Okay. It's curious though that uh, that like different principal components would be associated with the MR data from the two different cartilage. Like I have a hard time believing that the articular surface, the articular cartilage on one surface would sort of be more sensitive to a specific type of loading in the articular surface, in the articular cartilage on, on its contacting surface. Yeah, so if you look at the, I didn't want to highlight this, but yeah. a weakness is that the correlations were significant, but pretty weak. So they were 0 0.2, 0 0.3, maybe 0.4. They weren't super strong. Um, I do think you could see differences in acetabular and femoral cartilage. There, there could be differences just in the structural makeup, right? So it could accept loading differently. So that was actually my next question. Are you aware of research that's actually looked at the cellular and structural differences between femoral cartilage versus acetabular cartilage? I haven't, I haven't looked at it recently, and I don't know if it's been done in the hip. I want to say maybe it was done in the knee. And they saw differences yeah. and definitely differences between different joints. But I don't know if there's differences between two surfaces within the same joint off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Come back. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Um, on the MR images, like the change over time, I noticed most of the changes seem to be on the periphery, like on the edges of the cartilage rather than on the top. 
I guess obviously that's indicative of loading, but it somehow bounds into the TDI part, right? Like a lot of force is going through or a lot of stress strength is going through the top of the. Oh, are you saying on like that? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like near the bone? Yeah, exactly. Kind of like on, on the bottom edges that a lot of the changes were seen between like cluster one and cluster two, whereas there was less like difference with, at the, on the top of the Hang on. I'm just going to go back if that's cool. So I know that I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. So, like how, how you see the large changes here, but not so much at the top. And then the same oh. thing on these ones where you're seeing most of the like, difference. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, I think part of the reason for that is because this is just the first PC mode. So, if you look at the first five PC modes, you wind up seeing changes through different areas. Um, so like this one, and you have to interpret it, right? So it's my interpretation and it's subject to that. Um, but so when I looked at this, I was like, oh, it's mostly the femoral cartilage, but there were some um, modes that uh, you saw differences between like deep layers of cartilage and more superficial layers of cartilage. And I think there's been some studies that have seen changes um, like at the su superficial layer first um as opposed to the deep layer um so it could just be that it's because we're only looking at this first mode of variation and when i do have the other ones if you're really interested <laughs> it's a good observation though yeah i was wondering well what the um cause is of these associations so let's say you know it, uh, it's our ankle moment there's something about a seed that changes with um you know it's associated with uh, less organized collagen or something. So is the idea that OA is causing them to uh, load the drug, drug differently or is uh, joint loading causing the, um, the disorganized collagen? That is a great question that we're trying to answer, right? It's kind of like a chicken and the egg. Are they are people getting OA and starting to walk differently, or are they walking differently and that's contributing to OA? And I think another thing that factors into that is, you know, like BMI, um, just how healthy the individual is, as well as pain. And so right before I left UCSF, they were actually doing a pain invocation protocol, I think is the correct way to term it, where they were trying to determine if pain actually altered the way our subjects were loading. But that is a great question. I unfortunately don't have the answer to, but would love to hopefully make strides in that direction. Can I just add to that? Because intuitively, I, I always thought it was the other way around and you presented it. Intuitively, I thought, okay, well, when somebody has severe OA, I know they start to walk differently. And so I thought the more likely scenario, at least intuitively, to me would be that, yes, you start having certain problems that affects your gait, rather than you had that gait since you were 18 years old. Now you're 70, you have the same gait, and now it reflects itself in some changes in your cartilage. So, so, so the other way of interpretation. Yeah, I think it could easily go either way. Intuitive. To me, but you know that that's not that's not a scientific argument. Uh, the other thing, since you brought up BMI, BMI seems to be stronger correlated than, than anything else that we measure uh, many of the time. So, so how how important is biomechanics then? <laughs> and just some put somebody on a scale and, and kind of have a greater predictor than you know in. in Ten seconds, I get a break. You break a predictor than what you have to do over months and months of analysis. Um, and I think part of the problem with that is I was averaging T1 row and T2 across the entire cartilage. So that's you know you completely wash out any potential patterns of change. Um, and that it was after doing that study that we were like, oh, maybe the reason we're not seeing these associations is because we have this washout and maybe we need to look at a more voxel wise um, approach to looking at those associations. Actually, the other question I have, you know, I, I don't know anything about it, Mark, uh, maybe you can quickly explain to us what T1 row measures and how it relates to the amount of flow you're like and how close these relationships are and what your spatial resolution is that you can have with those type of things. So yeah, our spatial resolution was four millimeter slice thickness and pixels uh, in each image were 0.7, I believe, off the top of my head. 0.7 millimeters. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so in each slice, pretty good resolution, but I do think now there's probably some better sequences um, that have a smaller or more of an iso almost isotropic uh, voxel sizes. Um, so that could definitely help things. And we were only looking at four slices um, across the hip cartilage. Um, uh, and that part of that was to au help automate our um, automatic cartilage segmentation. Um, in terms of how associated um, T1 rho and T2 are to proteoglycan content, as well as um, water content and collagen disorganization, um, that's a, that work has been done previously from a number of different labs looking at the associations. And for the most part, um, you see pretty strong associations between the two, right? But it's not, I guess, a direct measurement. You're still associating your T1 rho intensity value, your T1 weighted intensity values with, you know, um, an actual uh, biological analysis of the amount of prote proteoglycan in that sample. Um, and so then that's extrapolated to in vivo testing, right? Um, so it's not a direct measurement. It's more of a quantification based on that association that and that work that's been previously done. Does that kind of answer your question? Right. Hello, Andrew and Brent. Well, when, I want to play off this last question from our, our, our yeah, sure. I just jump in. Sorry. Sure. Uh, so I want to know if you ever looked at the how much of the variation of BMI was explained by your MFPCAs. Because it could be that if you were able to do a PCA that included BMI, that none of the none of the biomechanics are related now in order to sorry. Um I think I also ran the analyses just with the BMI. So just ran the stepwise linear regression with just the BMI. But I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what those results were comparatively because I did this a few years ago. Yeah. You would think that BMI would influence somebody's like sagittal gain. Oh, but yeah, I didn't look at that right? correlation, no. Okay. But that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I was just looking at because we know that like age, gender, BMI, right, are uh, factors for OA. So I included those in the stepwise linear regression model along with the PC modes, but I didn't look at how BMI ties to the PC modes, which could be interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. So we have a, an online question right now. So go ahead, Jay. Would that be for me, John Matias? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, so a couple quick questions. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, Dr. Roach. Uh, you mentioned a couple things, one of which is, um, you know, that you're looking at T1 rho and, and T2 and, and, you know, basically, you know, you're looking at those numbers and, uh, you know, some would argue uh, that that's uh, roughly equivalent to the old days of, of looking at joint space thinning, uh, treating the numbers. And, uh, so um, when and, and agreed that you use the, the KL score as, as a subjective score, the real question amongst all those measures is, you know, how fine is the ruler? And um, you've already touched on, or the questions have already touched on, you know, your 0 0.7, 0 0.7 by four millimeters as one of the, the challenges of, of getting through partial volume effects on a convex surface. So. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, I, while I'm particularly worried about things like uh, partial volume effects and the uh, orientation dependence of T2 and, and the unclear relationship between proteoglycan and T1 rho, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty jazzed that you found anything, actually. <laughs> so um, I just wonder if you might uh, yes. com comment about that. Uh, and uh, I also have a comment later about your acetabulum and, and, uh, and femoral head uh, question. Sure, keep going. Okay, well, uh, the, the, the business, but you know, would you expect that the um, uh, contacting surfaces would be the same or different? And I think uh, just the, the acetabulum 
film is probably the poster child for uh, you have a, a, a sliding rotational uh, surface on the femoral head, whereas the acetabulum is essentially the egg cup uh, support for it. And so the, the, they really do have quite different um, functions, even though they're opposing surfaces. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that they might have different, um, uh, different uh, uh, morphometrics, if you will, or physiological metrics. And that's borne out actually in just uh, in, in normal uh, collagen orientation, for example, T2 uh, are quite different on those surfaces. So I wouldn't get discouraged by that, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Andrew, I, I was just wondering, have you ever thought of just looking at it on these, they take an average minute max over an area? So instead of average, getting an average of the whole surface, just get an average min value and an average max value in a subregion. So you look at the whole surface over subregions. So like say a millimeter by a millimeter. So kind of just cutting it up into some like smaller yeah, regions. But it, but it just kind of moves through the whole surface and just keeps shifting that hmm. voxel by voxel. You move that little window mm -hmm. and it takes an average of that window size and you get a min value mm -hmm. and a max value and kind of doing like a neighborhood <laughs> assessment yeah because like just by looking at that you've got areas high but if you're averaging it across everything it's biased one way or the other but if you get yep. an actual min value and an actual max value on on each one Trying to think how you would analyze a, a neighborhood with a sliding window like that, but I like that idea because then you would kind of have a boundary for each area. Yeah, because like when I did Fuji film work, you just kind of pick. We could either get a pixel value, but it's like going well. Is a single pixel enough to say that was increasing curvature versus taking one millimeter or point two five millimeters? Square in a certain area and averaging all the pixels in that area. Yep. Yeah. And there's some groups that are looking at that or doing something similar. They'll kind of like essentially compare like an OA group and a healthy group, let's say. And then they'll say, like, oh, well, this area on the cartilage was all significantly different. So we're just going to focus our analysis on this significantly different area. And then they do a bunch of other analyses. But I feel like if you're using, and uh, I feel like it kind of skews the results, but they're kind of looking at creating regions of area based on what they're finding to be different. Um, so I'm just this sounds a little bit stronger. Because the, because all your tail storm scorings were divided up between the two groups. It could be that you're actually at a different mm -hmm. stage of a way, like maybe the cartilage is swelling or maybe it's shrinking and you captured both groups in these clusters. Maybe if you were able to just get a max for both and compare how they differ. But how slightly uh, bigger resolution. Yeah, because you can yeah. take the average of everything, but then also if you get a max, so you kind of have three groups within cluster one. Yep. See so their separation. Hmm. I like it. Thank you. I'm just gonna write myself a note. Carry on. Um, I noticed in I think one of your opening slides that you mentioned that you were doing the side plane test. Yes. And it got me thinking a little bit about just something simple building off Walter's point about just things that you can measure measure clinically a little bit more easily. And I thought, oh wow, this is like a pretty easy thing to do to test for hip strength. How do those factors play into so the, the first part of the study, actually, I compare, I did a sex differences um, analysis and then also found um, some significant associations with whose scores as well as side planks, um, which we think was getting at just the hip muscle strength, as you said. Um, we did measure, we used a dynamometer to measure hip strength. Um, we've looked at that data in a lot of ways and nothing has um, come out as important there. 
Um, I don't know if that's just because there's nothing there or if maybe, I think it's really hard to measure like ab adduction strength on a dynamometer and not be able to use your glute muscles, right? Um, so I think that might be part of it. Um, and then the other thing we're starting to look at now is um, actual muscle quality using MR. So using um, different uh, fat and water images to assess how much fat is in the muscle um, and seeing if that's tied to muscle strength as well. How did the site data afterwards? Hang on, I have a slide. Yep. Will this show if I yeah. Okay, I think that's all of the animations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had T1 row PC4 was correlated with who sit to stand and side plank. Uh, Meaning that the, the, the weaker, like the lower the plank time and the more the number of repetitions, the greater the progression of it. Yeah, so if they had more advanced OA, they didn't hold the side plank as long, which is as you would expect. In the same situation with our sit to stand, we also had some associations, I think, with our um, walk test and the who's metrics. So it was in the direction you would think. So people who had more degeneration or patterns of more degeneration tended to not perform as well or report as favorably on the who's metrics. But also notice that when our people, when our participants were coming in, like some of them would be like, oh, hey, um, did I beat my side plank time from last year? Oh. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> they're training. Just sorry, one little final thing. One, I, when you said you used like a, like a non injured or non OA population as your reference uh, for the for the changes, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. For some reason, like when you said that, I thought, could you like? Is there anything about the injured people that you could be sort of stuck with the injured people as reference as a reference point? And I, I don't know. I was, I was sort of stuck on why you landed there as as that that's your that's your change. Versus like um, so we didn't have any injured uh, participants. We just had people on a spectrum of OA. So I guess, yes, we could have used the whole population to calculate these scores, which is a little bit more pop, um, which is maybe more common. Um, I think it would have been hard just because our reference standard is not super robust to say like, okay, yes, we're only going to use KL grade three as our reference standard, because I think a recent paper showed in the knee that if you are diagnosed as KL two in the knee, you are equally as likely to be diagnosed KL one or three. That's pretty bad odds in my mind. Um, so I wouldn't, no offense to the radiologists I worked with, they're amazing, but I think it's just the scoring system that they have. It's really hard to do. So yeah, for this, we chose to use, we wanted to see how people changed in regards to what we hope is standard healthy aging, but that is of course debatable because um, there could be something going on with those eight participants, but we did like look through their scans with the radiologists, looked at all of their scores, made sure that they didn't appear to have any odd abnormalities or reported pain or anything like that. Amy, so I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so returning back to some of the first studies you showed with the uh, PCA analysis, when I look at predictions of so time continuous curves that you mentioned, I see variation in two modes. One, I see variation in, say, the amplitude on the y-axis, then I often see variation on the x-axis, the, the timing of spatial Just wondering, does your analysis sort of account for both of those modes of variation inside of this PCA? I imagine that could be more of a second one to kind of wash. Yeah, so the, the thing I really like about MFPCA is the fact that you can have sparse data. And like I had time normalized all of my data, so it doesn't account for different timing, but we did have all of our participants walk at roughly the same average speed of 1.35 meters per second. Um, so that was kind of taken out of the equation, we hope, um, but you could run MFPCA on different, um, uh, different lengths of data. So 
It could be people walking at different speeds if you wanted to look at how that timing changed. And that would end up probably, yeah, as you say, as a PC mode, if you hadn't normalized it, would be my guess. So even if you do normalize it, you probably still see that variation. It's just instead of being in terms of seconds, it's in terms of say a percent of day time. Once in a while, but it's usually not one of the like primary modes. It's usually something that's like 10% or less. More often it's like a change in slope during mid stance or something like that. Or yeah, the vertical shift, which I think with the vertical shift, that's partial, that can partially be marker placement, which is why I like biplane fluoroscopy, just saying. Questions? Just a quick question. I, you didn't spend a lot of time on study. I think you study two where you, the moments came out as being still analyzing, but yes. Okay, so do you have a hypothesis? I mean, are the higher moments going to be associated with a uh, uh, higher prevalence of OA? Well, it was it was more of like high in one direction versus high in another direction, at least in the ankle. I'm thinking maybe it's the inversion moments of people who are, have higher moments would have, um, be more likely to have OA, but I'm, I don't, I'm not sure yet. And which, which moment was it at the knee that came out as significant? It was, I ran all three together. So it was all three planes. But I have that as a backup slide too, if you're really interested. I thought I saw something like it was like sagittal hips, something knee, and then all three components at the ankle. Yeah. So, I'm so study. yeah. So the first study I ran hip, knee, and ankle sagittal plane as one analysis. And then in the second study, I thought maybe it would make more sense to run the three planes of motion for each hip together in one MFPC analysis. So this is, sorry, it's poorly labeled because it's a backup slide, but sagittal, sagittal coronal and transverse. So X, Y, Z for hip moment. So that's all of your hip moment data in one analysis. And again, this, you're getting down to like 13% of variation. So as that gets smaller and for the hip, it was even smaller than that. Um, it gets harder to look at what your changes are, but I would say you're seeing like amplitude shifts here and same with um, in the sagittal plane, maybe a little bit in the coronal. So the largest number amount of variance in, in, in the population that has hip OA was the ankle moves, not the knee or the hip. Mm -hmm. Predict the predictors. But that's where I need to dig a little bit more into how can we tell which of those features was most important and whether it's people with high PC modes versus low PC modes that were predicting OA or non-OA. So TBD, I'll get back to you. I do kind of have a fact about Um, I didn't, um, but the, uh, the analysis I ran automatically accounts for that, for differences. It's a pretty fancy function, would recommend. Say that again? It, it doesn't have anything to do with the loading. You said, you know, the big variables are good because they're giving something about the input. 
well, yeah, technically they're moments, not loads, but they do give us a little bit more information about loading patterns as opposed to. Many combinations of eating and loading, keeping the final result of that loading. Say that again. Oh, yes, there are many ways that it could arise to cause it. Yes, absolutely. Possibly. But we can look at how that. Yes. So it's a combination of the two, right? And yeah, so it's internal moments, but yeah, we're not sure what's what's causing that because we didn't measure EMG. Uh, so you mentioned the MRI. Uh, has this ever, has your approach ever been used to look at sort of correlations between PC scores, the movement patterns, so the moments, and uh, like uptake of like ATF? I find that you should mention that. Yes, I'm doing that right now. So I'm trying to uh, get a paper out before ISMRM. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I've looked at how these different MFPC modes, because um, the subjects that we used for this study, a subset of them came in and we collected PETAMAR data on them. Um, so I ran like the same analysis on those subjects to see if it, are there particular patterns of movement um, that might be related to SUV. Um, and that um, Padamar is a bear to work with. So I can't remember what the associations are off the top of my head, but I've been looking at that. Happy to share if you're interested. Before we move on to Walter, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have a very simple question. You know. All right, everybody on board service is difficult questions. I have a very simple question. <laughs> um, I'm surprised to make two cluster analysis that it was like sex specific, you know, uh, more males here and more females. Do you have any idea why? Any explanation for that? Yeah, so the first analysis I ran looking at just overall PC modes, um, how they compared. Um, just a, I did a comparison, so I associated with um, I looked at correlations with BMI, KL score, um, who's I think I showed some of that who's as well as functional tests, and then I also did sex differences, um, and so I found the same results. Um, males all were were more likely to have higher PC1 score, so they had higher or accelerated changes in that femoral cartilage, and females were more likely to have smaller changes in the femoral cartilage. So I wasn't sure when we ran the cluster analysis if that would be the primary driver. I wasn't sure what would be the primary driver of splitting up groups and how many groups we would end up with. But um, it kind of makes sense that we were seeing those sex differences before the cluster analysis. And then when we did run the cluster analysis, that was the primary driver. And I mean, they are, those two PC modes are the largest um, amount of variation in the population. So it kind of makes sense that those were the two that it focused on. So we you then generalize the results that women progress slower in hip OA than men? Potentially. I mean, it's only a two year Two date, um, two year short term changes. Um, I also have looked at three year changes. Um, I don't, I don't think I saw like a ton of difference in two year versus three year data, but it is short term changes. Um, so I think it would be interesting to run on longer term changes that are a little bit more, what's the word, concrete. I guess that you know that there's something happening there. That would be a super interesting result. You know, show that. Yeah, and it's also, I don't think there's as much hip OA research as knee OA. Um, so when I was actually trying to figure out, so a lot of knee OA studies show that women are more likely to have OA than men. So 
all every all my colleagues at UCSF were like, this is in contradiction to everything we've seen. Um, so I kind of went back to the literature and it turns out that like, yeah, there are a few studies that do say that HIPOA is more prevalent in females versus males, but they're like not that well done. Um, so when they were ranked in like a meta-analysis review paper, they were like, yeah, you essentially can't say this because these studies aren't high enough quality. But, but prevalence will not necessarily be related to the rate of progression. You know, you could it, still have sorry, a much for both. Yeah. higher rate of women with people or eight but they just tend to progress lower. I mean, that's still I think, inherently a contradiction. I think um, the meta-analysis looked at both prevalence as well as rate of progression. And I think the rate of progression studies were even fewer. Yeah, everyone likes to study the knee. You, well, that's a great question. So, I mean, you might have two mechanisms of joint degeneration. Like, people always focus on the big people getting away, the BMI, because it's so important. But, like, 50% of people with OA are petite women with low bone mineral density. They make up a huge, they make up a huge amount of the population with osteoarthritis. I'm not sure about the hip or whatever. Um, but presumably, maybe, maybe in that type of population, a small female with low bone mineral density. That could be an indicator. Just a different type of OA. I don't know. Yeah, and we had a very healthy population. So we had two individuals with a BMI over 30. Um, people in the San Francisco area are very fit, apparently. What are you, what, yeah, I was going to ask, <laughs> what was the demographics? <laughs> uh, primarily white and okay. maybe four to seven percent Asian and then everything else was like one or two percent yeah. yeah not very diverse I have to answer the brain's comment here because because the reason why we started doing uh you know high fat sucrose obesity induced rack studies was a comment by a clinician Jillian Hawker at one of our OA retreats and she said, what are you guys talking about? What I'm seeing in the clinic are 65-year-old women who are overweight. That's what she said. Mm. That's, it. That, that's it. That's her clinical. And then, I, then I thought, OK, so we better start that. But I think you raise a good point. And one of the things I'm interested in moving forward is looking at different populations. So more minority populations, because everyone just likes to study, no offense, white dudes. And then you, you know, you know what the critical phenotype is for bad surgical outcomes, according to my favorite person, Dr. Sai Frank. What's the critical outcome? What do you look for? He said he always has bad outcomes with naturally red haired people. <laughs> There's a population. Okay, you know, all right, I'll add that to my list. list. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it is, you know, just to, it is interesting though that your like your BMI seems to be do nothing else. They would seem to be well fit. Oh, they're all quite fit. Like, oh, I just I go and I swim in the bay every morning, five yeah. miles so, or something. But, like, okay. So just to that point, I mean, you start talking about a way of sort of scientific statement, which is I would think intuition would be these are athletic people who've had athletic backgrounds who uh, probably got hip changes from years of doing sports and all this other stuff. And by virtue of that, you think that there would be very different mechanisms and things happening with them than compared to, let's say, more North American, probably like seven sedentary overweight, all the other. Yeah, 100%. That could be two different ways of looking at it. We did, did you not. Look at it. Hip at all? Uh, we did measure it, yes. And nothing did it get paid? I don't think I evaluated that. But Just because like it, with that AI, like like those sorts of degenerative issues that hockey players get and skaters get, you know, um, you know, range of motion is one thing that I did remove FAI from our from analysis. Your, we did have a couple people that kind of snuck in with FAI right. and they were removed. Yeah, because that is a pr predictor of OA. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's also like how do you define FAI? So exactly, these are nebulous, right? I think, right? So you, uh, you have people in there where some physicians might say, "Oh, for sure, this is an 
Yeah, and it's um, interesting, you know, some of uh, other work done at UCSF was looking at like bone shape, kind of getting at like, you know, the alpha angle and yeah. um, the cam bump and that type of thing, um, and how that ties to T1 row and T2 and did find some significant associations. So I think there's definitely like it all comes together. It's bone shape and cartilage health and how you move, it's, you know, multifactorial. So if you were able to identify someone and, you know, predict this and they're early so the hope would be that we could say like oh you have this pattern and we have identified this pattern as a predictor let's see if we can do some gait retraining so that you don't have that pattern or we get you to a pattern that you might not be as likely to progress to oa um that is a very future me goal. So yeah exactly yep Oh, sure. One more right, very yeah. naive question for the bone and not cartilage, but um, how does does cartilage degeneration like accelerate with the menopause? Like if like mm. the bones kind of feel all of a sudden have any system remodeling? I don't think so, but I think there are more studies kind of focusing on that. And I think that's kind of brought to the forefront this importance that we really do need to be looking at sex differences. We can't just look at males. We can't maybe run our analyses together. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head if people have actually looked at menopause. I, I'm sure they have. I'm just not sure. All right. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. All right. Well, thank you, speaker.